Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Good, awesome. I uh, just wanna give you the lay of the land here, um, go over some of the things before we get our presentation started. Um, emergency exits, we have um, four doors here that are exits. And of course we go out that door and this door and exit out the front or the side. So there's plenty of places to exit. If you need to use the restroom, you can head out this door here and the restrooms are across the way. Um, please feel free. Um, I will be in the back of the room in case you need something or something happens. I'll be back there um, for everyone this evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our public lecture series. And I'll hand it over to Ed to get us started. Anyway, I think you'll be able to hear me. Anyway, so that's Adriana Reza. She's the one that organizes our our educational programs here at the University of Texas and is responsible for this evening uh, seminar series. So, so anyway, today we have one of our new superstars here, Dr. Mark Lieber, uh, who's our, our second newest uh, um, faculty member here. So we have one. Uh, Karen Kristen, who just started this past year. But anyway, Mark has an interesting uh, background. So uh, he did his undergraduate work at Boston University. Boston, where I grew up. So anyway, did it with the Boston University Marine Program, which we refer to as well. Uh, they did his master's at the Boston University Woods Hole Program, his PhD in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. He did a postdoc in Denmark, and then he did. He was an assistant professor in uh, Switzerland in Zurich. Uh, and I can't remember that, how you pronounce. I don't know what ETA is. I don't know what it stands for. The Wisdom Institute of Technology. Uh, okay. Anyway, but anyway, that, and now he's come uh, to join us, and to see he's likes to do biogeochemistry. He also does geobiology. He does some really interesting things where he takes some deep cores. Finds living bacteria even in rocks and things, so he's done some really interesting things. And I never expected he would turn to growing algae. He told me a year ago that you know Mark is going to start a project. He's been funded to do some work to develop uh, some uh, algae culture here in Texas. Anyway, that's what he's going to tell us about tonight. So anyway, as we can say, this is Mark Viva. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the great intro. Uh, can everybody hear me clearly? Am I too loud or too okay? Louder? Okay, I'll speak louder. Um, so thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I'm very impressed with how many people came. Um, and uh, as Ed said, this is completely new terrain for me. Uh, we just got it started here in a project a month ago. Um, and um, one of the key players on the project is in the audience today. So can seaweed farming support a green economy in Texas intracoastal waters? And this is something to be shown and hopefully found in the coming years. So um, <clears throat> I have four components in my talk today. I'll briefly just talk about myself and, uh, and, what I, and then about my interests in biogeochemistry and the carbon cycle. Um, and then I'll go into why seaweed farming is both environmentally and economically um, very important potent or of great potential, let's say. And then I'll talk finally about why Texas, out of all places, I think is a really great place for seaweed farming. So um, as Ed already introduced me, um, I came over from Switzerland uh, a year and a half ago with my family, uh, who's in the audience here. And um, we've uh, quickly uh, accustomed to life here. We really been, we love the nature here um, and been very impressed with that, but we've also been really impressed and also kind of inspired with the human imprint on the natural systems and the kinds of things we get to see here on this canal that's right over there. Uh, so it's been a very inspiring place and we're happy to be here. And um, my work has been kind of all over the map when it comes to aquatic systems, but most of my work has really been at the on the bottom of aquatic systems. So I've looked a lot at intertidal and coastal sediments. So what we're seeing up there on the left-hand side 
Those are sediments, uh, sand flat. I've looked at deep subsurface sediments where we drill up to two kilometers below the seafloor. Um, deep down to see what are the limits of life deep in the ocean sediments and in the Earth's crust, and also done some work on lakes in Switzerland. And then um, some of the work involved also looking at uh, Earth's crustal samples and also draw, drilling even into mantle rocks and looking at potential for life there. And then while in Switzerland, we had very interesting alpine systems where glaciers retreating and we looked at the evolution of some glacial stream environments. And lastly, aquaculture was a project or a field of research I got interested in while there. We started a project on looking at indoor cultivation of Atlantic salmon. And this is kind of our general direction. I'd like to continue here, but now focusing on seaweed and looking at how we can grow and whether we can grow seaweed in natural systems here. That brings me then to my uh, research interests. So I'm broadly interested in the field of biogeochemistry, which as the name already suggests, is a very interdisciplinary interdisciplinary field that combines biology, geology, and chemistry. And it's, this is in general, or what, what this, the, the field is, is the study how, of how chemical substances are flowing through the Earth's systems. And this graph here just shows you what I mean with that. Here we have basically the entire Earth system from the atmosphere to the deep Earth mantle and core. And biogeochemistry studies how elements like carbon or nitrogen or oxygen are transported and interacting and exchanging between all these different systems. Most of our work is on the surface environments, but these deep environments also are in constant exchanges with the surface and therefore over very long geologic timescales, important in controlling the conditions that we find on Earth today. I'm specifically interested in the carbon cycle and the carbon cycle is a very good cycle to study with bi in, a, in the field of biogeochemistry because it's very profoundly altered by biological activity. And it, um, as we can see here, we have organisms like plants and animals on land and the oceans. We have marine biota ranging from fish to jellyfish and corals. And, and all of these organisms having, are having a very strong influence on the carbon cycle. They control how much CO2 is in the atmosphere to a significant degree. And they also control how much organic carbon then gets um, deposited at the seafloor. And it's that seafloor, which is over geologic time scales, a very important system because that's where, where over geologic time, we have the biggest carbon sink on earth. And what that means, I'll explain to you next. So here's a simplified sketch showing you the atmosphere, the marine water column, the sediments, and the oceanic crust. And sediments are this brown layer here in the middle where anything that dies off and any sand that gets deport, deposited into the ocean eventually settles. And the things that are living organisms that die off are consisting of organic carbon. And it's ultimately the fate of that organic carbon that I want to understand. And this is really important because a significant fraction of the organic carbon that makes it to the sediments ends up being buried there and stays there for hundreds of millions of years. And another portion, about 90 to 95%, um, actually will be microbially degraded. So it's microorganisms that are decomposing, they're eating their organic carbon, decomposing it, and then producing CO2 and methane. And CO2 and methane are two gases that have very strong impacts on our climates. And therefore you can see the connection here, how studying the carbon cycle in sediments has a very strong relevance for understanding the climate on earth. So the big question is what determines whether that organic carbon stays put and stays in that sink or is returned to the water and overlying atmosphere through the activity of microorganisms. And the amount of carbon that's down there is really gargantuan. Here's a simplified graph that shows you the amount of organic carbon and inorganic carbon that we find in sediments and so-called sedimentary rocks, 75,000 times 10 to 18 grams carbon. That doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't mean anything to me until I compare it to all the carbon that's in us in plants, animals, soil, the atmosphere, seawater, and the very surface layer of sediments combined, that's up here. We're talking about several thousand times less carbon that is in all those systems, which we think of as being huge carbon um, pools, um, are found down here. So it's a much greater pool, and you can imagine how that pool has a strong influence on the carbon in the atmosphere and the Earth's conditions. 
So um, back to uh, sediments. Um, nowadays, we are having a profound influence on the carbon cycle by burning fossil fuels like petroleum and natural gas and uh, cement production and many other things. And that results in a change in the balance. And, and, and it's a very interesting scientific experiment that we're experiencing right now, which unfortunately will also or may have some very severe consequences in the long run. So um, just to give you an example of how profound this change has been, here we can see temperature, global average temperatures um, are shown here on the y-axis at zero. And um, on the x-axis, we have um, a time scale from 1850 to 2020. And if we compare it to the mid, the 20th century average, global average temperatures were about a quarter degree Celsius below the mid 20th century average from 1850 to 1940 or 35. And then we had this big change uh, since then. Global average temperatures have gone up significantly, especially since 1980 or so. And this corresponds to an average temperature increase on Earth that's estimated to be right around 1.2 degrees Celsius, which is a little over two degrees Fahrenheit. That is a significant change in temperatures and the overwhelming scientific evidence, we can't prove it, but the overwhelming evidence suggests that it's directly tied to the increase in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere by the burning, mostly by the burning of fossil fuels. And we are in an interesting turning point right now where if we keep going along this route, we may enter a very catastrophic state in the next 20 to 30 years. When exactly, nobody knows, but it's uh, be very risky to continue along this route and what we instead, instead need to do is decrease our emissions down to zero using by burning less fossil fuels, by having technologies that avoid the emissions of fossil fuels. And on top of that, that is not, whoops, that's not even enough. We need to not only stop emitting, fo oh, sorry, fossil fuels, but we need to bring CO2 concentrations down to about 350 parts per million, which were the concentrations around 1990. This is wide, widely, what many or most scientists in the field of climate research uh, think is the safe and long-term sustainable level. And the big question is, we already know how can we stop emitting CO2, but how can we actually reduce this CO2 from the atmosphere? And that's where things like seaweed farming could become important. So we know what the solution to increasing global temperatures is. is we need to stop putting CO2 out there but the question is, how do we bring back CO2 concentrations to the level of 1990? And this is where the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine uh, back in 2021 had a summit where they discussed possible research agendas for carbon dioxide removal and reliable sequestration and ways of engineering natural environments to increase the carbon removal in these natural environments in order to um, bring back CO2 levels. And one particular uh, strategy that was among the mix of strategies, no one strategy can solve the problem. One of them was seaweed cultivation. This is what got me interested in the whole field. And then the question is, what are the benefits? Why is this being proposed as a solution? So unfortunately that one got a little messed up, but when we look at, when we wanna understand how seaweed farming could be important, we have to understand Photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is a process that's performed by plants, by seaweeds, by microscopic algae, and involves the uptake of CO2 from water or from the atmosphere together with water and the absorption of photons from the sun, which provide energy, to then reduce the CO2 to produce organic carbon and oxygen, which got moved over here. In a nutshell, it's this process here. We have water, we have bubbles in there, let's just assume there's CO2, and we have light from the sun. And then we have this miracle called photosynthesis that then converts that into seaweed. The way this could potentially work is by on a large scale, um, performing ocean afforestation or seaweed farming uh, by developing these plots where we can grow seaweeds on ropes and produce even with certain species, kelp species, these forests that are underwater. And this is being hyped or discussed a lot in the media these days. And it became um, popular in part when Brent Smith, um, one of the pioneers, published a book called Eat Like a Fish a few years ago, 
It's a very interesting book to read. So how does this all work? Why would this help potentially contribute to bringing the CO2 down? Well, we have to think of, again, the carbon and the sediments. And what we do, if we increase the amount of biomass production by seaweed, we're increasing the amount of organic carbon that is coming down to the seafloor. When we do that, there's a lot of studies that have shown you increase the amount of organic carbon that gets down to the seafloor, you also, in almost all cases, end up burying more organic carbon. So we can increase the removal of CO2 the, through, from the atmosphere with seaweed farming, potentially. There are also some other environmental benefits. Um, it's been shown, especially in so-called polycultures, where seaweeds are grown with um, invertebrates such as scallops and mussels and oysters and clams. This is being done already a lot in, uh, off of Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Connecticut, that when we create these kinds of artificial habitats, we can also have a, a strong increase in biodiversity. Uh, we see suddenly much higher biomass of fish and it's been, research has been done to try to understand how this is happening. And based on a study in Scotland, it was proposed, well, it's the combination of increased food which is not necessarily good for us because we want to eat or use that, but at least they're, they're benef benefiting from that. But also the increase in shelter that protects small and larval and young animals um, from predation. And also that um, these plots can serve as excellent spawning habitats for many invertebrates and fish. Now, luckily, since money rules the world, there also are economic benefits. It's not just purely environmental. And uh, th this is clearly evidenced if you look at this graph here where we have global seaweed production from 1950 to 1920 to 2020, millions of wet tons of seaweed produced per year. And we can see what we would call an exponential increase uh, since 1950 in the total production of seaweed worldwide. There are two major, two sources to this. One is the collection of seaweed from natural habitats. That has been almost stable. The big one that's increased is the cultivation. Um, a lot of this has happened in East Asia, but also in Northern Europe, uh, in Canada and parts of the US, there's been a dramatic increase. Um, so annual production of seaweed has gone up by around 5.8% per year. Um, and that, that corresponds to about a threefold increase in global production since 2000, um, from 2000 to 2020. So this seems to be economically viable, just looking at that. Question then is, why is it economically viable? What, are the, what is the purpose of growing seaweed? And there are many different purposes, and I'm gonna give you some examples. So um, there are ones that relate to seaweed functioning as a um, food or, or dietary or health item, and some involving non-digestible products. And here's just a list. So, Seaweed is both human food, it can be incorporated into animal feed, it can be used for med medicinal purposes, it's an excellent fertilizer, bioplastics, so biodegradable plastics can be made of it, biofuels can be made, and also it's an important ingredient of cosmetic products. And if you look at of the total seaweed production on Earth, 37% of that, so more than one third, is going towards feeding people, um, one fourth roughly to feeding animals, and then the other major ones are medicinal, fertilizer, and bioplastics. So how does this work? Why is it an important food? Well, in East Asia, it's a very major component of the diet, and increasingly also so in Western countries, where we very much enjoy eating a lot of the, uh, the food that is um, traditional to East Asian countries. It's also something that's very important as a food additive, without many of us being aware of it. Seaweed. Um, compounds such as carrageenan or agar, these are compounds that are produced by seaweeds, are very, very common components of ice cream, of yogurt, tofu, and also of many um, uh, pastry products. And there they're added uh, because they change the texture of these products. They are added as a thickener, as a replacement for gelatin. And they also have antimicrobial properties in many cases, so they can also be a, kind of a natural preservative. Animals also can benefit tremendously from incorporating seaweed into their diet, even cattle and chickens that are not naturally known to feed on seaweed. But it's been shown that the health of, of poultry can be increased by including 
dietary supplements made of seaweed, that milk production has, can be increased. And I'm not, some of these studies are limited. I'm just giving you examples of what has been claimed or, sh or shown according to certain studies. And a very important one is that incorporating seaweed into the diet of cattle can have a big impact on methane emissions from cattle. So this is actually an environmental impact, but these are these human food we're growing here in the form of cows and cattle. And one big problem with cattle is that they have a digestive tract that relies on bacteria and other microorganisms that eat the cellulose that they take up from the plants that they cannot digest themselves. They need the microorganisms to do that. But those microorganisms, or some of them, produce methane as an end product. That methane then is released in copious quantities by the cattle, mostly through burping. And interestingly, it's been shown that when we feed certain seaweeds to cattle, the methane emissions can be almost brought down to null, to by 99% in some cases, and 90, more than 90% in several documented cases. So this is uh, interesting if we look at just methane emissions from people um, or human activities in the US. One quarter is enteric fermentation, which is mainly cattle. Um, another quarter is natural gas and petroleum systems. And if you look at all that methane, so it's, this is a huge amount. If we could change that, we would really have an impact. We also have to look at the, the state of Texas in particular. Texas is the biggest emitter of methane in the United States. And a lot of it is well, it's, it's from both of those sources, it's natural gas and petroleum, but a lot of it is also from cattle. We have around 12 million cattle here. So by adding seaweed to the food of cattle, maybe we can have a big impact. We can change it and make Texas a much smaller emitter of methane. And that's important because methane is more than 20 times more effective than CO2 at warming the atmosphere. So therefore, being able to affect that, working with cattle farmers by feeding seaweed to the cattle could be important. Medicinal examples are shown next. So it's been shown already the, the, the father of modern or father of medicine, Hippocrates already said 400 BC, may your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. Here we see the 20 countries, um, which includes Hong Kong, which is no longer a country, um, with the highest life expectancy on earth. It's interesting to see, and this is pure correlation. I'm not sure, we, we cannot know if this is the reason, but it's interesting to note that the top five are countries where seaweed is a significant component of the diet. And again, it's way too complex to understand the reasons, but it's an interesting, interesting factor. And in fact, it's been shown that certain seaweeds can help um, prevent cancer or can be used to treat cancers uh, to a certain degree. They can be antiviral in properties. They have antioxidant properties. They can help with cardiovascular protection, anti-inflammatory activities, and they can also be anticoagulants. And this is because seaweeds produce a very wide range of compounds that are used by these plants uh, as natural defenses. And it turns out, or it seems according to many studies that there's a tremendous potential also um, to improve the quality of medical treatment and also of prevention of diseases by including seaweed into our diet. Next, fertilizer. This is a major uh, use of it. I don't think I have to explain too much what fertilizer is, but the different uses are. So in organic agriculture, um, it's becoming more important as an organic source of fertilizer where seaweed is basically um, incubated with water and then, or cooked, and then the so-called seaweed tea, which is very rich in phosphorus and nitrogen and potassium, is fed to uh, plants. Uh, to vet, to this case, we're talking about greenhouse gardening, but there's also liquid um, seaweed foods that can be purchased and also uh, pellets that can be used for golf courses and lawns and et cetera, and agricultural fields. So that is increasingly becoming important. And then there's bioplastics, and you've probably seen all of these images before. Uh, where we have petroleum or natural gas-based plastic, which is what we think of as plastic most of the time, which is very poorly degradable, um, accumulating in the world's oceans and causing all kinds of problems, not only diminishing the aesthetic value, but also causing health problems to sea turtles or even being mistaken as food by, for instance, albatross, adult albatross feeding cups um, or lids of plastic bottles to their young as a food source and causing strong declines in the populations of these seabirds. 
Well, this is where also seaweed-based biodegradable plastics could be contribute to solving this problem um, in the future, and they already are becoming more and more established in uh, many commercial products. Biofuels and cosmetics are less important overall today. I will just mention that biofuels that can be produced from seaweed include biodiesel, biogas, and bioethanol. And for cosmetic products, they're oftentimes used as anti-aging um, um, compounds because of their anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, and also as preservatives because many of the compounds they produced are antimicrobial. So with all of this, it seems probably you're thinking, this is, sounds too good to be true. With all this economic potential, and these great environmental benefits, why isn't seaweed farming a big thing in Texas or everywhere? Um, and could I be maybe a, uh, a snake oil salesman who's trying to sell you something that's not true? Is any of this even, if this is just marketing and nonsense or is it real? Um, and there are the first books that are already questioning this. There's a book called The Seaweed Delusion, which argues why it's not a solution to climate change. There have been online lectures where you can look up where there's a discussion, is this all a hype or not? Well, I think that's exactly where, as a scientist, that's where my job starts. And the job of my team is to figure out what is the truth. At least that's, that's our goal with our work. We wanna know what is the truth here. We, of course, hope it's good, but we want to figure out first and foremost, is it true or not? And so this is something we want to investigate in the coming years now in Texas. So why could intercoastal Texas be just the perfect place for seaweed farming? I'm just saying this as a pure hypothesis or speculation, but it's an interesting and intriguing idea, I think. So some of the explanations are here. There are many native species here that have already been cultivated elsewhere. So it'd be an easy jump start to maybe collect them and then grow them in the lab and start doing some experiments. Here are just three examples of seaweeds. One is Gracilaria tikvaye, which is used to produce agar, which is a thickener used in many dietary products. Seaweed salads oftentimes include alva intestinalis. Dictyota cervicornis has very potent anti-inflammatory properties and has been proposed to be a potential cure to Alzheimer's. It grows here. So our aim is now to collect these seaweed species here and grow them in the lab. And we have what also is in favor of Texas, we have all these easily accessible shallow water habitats here. We don't need a big ship to go there. A small boat, family-friendly business potentially could be operated uh, from a small boat in shallow Texas um, estuaries, and perhaps we could grow these there. We also have a very long growth season um, and could potentially grow different species at different times of the year. And we also know, even though when you go out here, you don't see a lot of seaweed, whenever we have a boat or a mooring, you will get seaweed because seaweed needs... period of support for sustainable aquaculture uh, by the state of Texas, by Texas Sea Grant. So this is an opportunity to see whether we can do something. Now here being the right place at the right time, we were very fortunate to last year receive $10 million from the state of Texas, in part thanks to Representative Todd Hunter to create a Texas Gulf Coast Research Center here at the University of Texas Marine Science Institute. And I was fortunate to be, be awarded a quarter million dollars of that to then do a pilot project to see whether seaweed farming could work here. Here's our team. Um, so I don't need to introduce myself, but Claire White and Daniel Hardin, our research assistants who just started a month ago, who have already been, been very, very busy and getting a lot, of work, a lot of work done, which I'll show you. And we're not just scientists here, we're also working actually with some economists from the main campus in Austin. So here we have Ning Lin, who works at the Bureau of Economic Geology and our postdoc, Sobhan Razum, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and they're economists who are gonna look at, is there actual economic potential? What are potential markets for seaweed farming here and seaweed products? We're supported by Ken Dunton, who's a professor here and botanist and his graduate student, Kyle Campistran Fossa, who is also a botanist by training and has experience in growing seaweed. And we also are collaborating with Chris Hollenbeck, Professor Chris Hollenbeck from Texas A&M University's Corpus Christi, 
campus who runs their aquaculture facility in Flower Bluff, and Harlan Miller, who has a former PhD student here, who has over 20 years of experience working the seaweed industry under his belt. So I think we have a strong team, and now we need to get to work and see what we can find. So there's five different components to the project. The first one is to find these seaweeds and collect them. Next one is to do then laboratory-based cultivation. We need to be able to propagate them in the lab in order to then cultivate them and transfer them to the field. Then we need to show that they actually will grow with the setups we're proposing in the field and then see whether there's an actual economic potential, which our collaborators will determine. And lastly, if all of the first four aspects are met, then we will work with business and um, businesses and farmers on potential uses and applications. This is where we currently are. We've collected local specimen and um, Daniel and Claire are just in the process of getting started with cultivating them. So where we're doing this, well, we are at the, we're surrounded here by the Mission Aransas National Estuary and Research Reserve, which op owns this building here um, and is hosting us generously for this lecture series. And the Mission Aransas National Estuary and Research Reserve has, a, has several monitoring stations here shown in the black triangles that are north of here in Copano Bay, Mesquite Bay, and Aransas Bay, where they're continuously measuring salinity, so salt concentrations, temperature, water transparency, and also have a monthly nutrient monitoring program. And we decided that's a great setup for our seaweed plots. So we wanna have our seaweed plots near these monitoring stations where we can then use the data that they are producing on the environmental conditions and then correlate that to see whether certain seaweed species grow better under certain conditions than others. This is where, where we're at in the lab. We were provided with um, a very nice aquaculture space on, in the basement next door. We have these huge tanks here, um, but we're not there yet. The first step was to get different species of seaweed collected. Um, and we can see here a closer up and here an even closer up of this. This is a gracilaria. It's a red algae that we can use to make or extract agar. And we're starting to grow them in the lab using our incubator and then eventually if all goes well, we're hoping to upscale this to also grow larger quantities in these tanks. And um, I also have some progress to report. And I think it's maybe interesting for you to see how seaweed reproduces. And this is a key step in the cultivation of seaweed. So here we have just this picture or photograph showing you these little uh, budding structures, which are called sp sporophytes. And uh, Daniel and Claire were lucky enough to be out there assembling these at the right time uh, right as they're getting ready to reproduce. And so transfer these to the lab. And our aim is now to create the conditions that are right for these seaweed sporophytes, which are the uh, reproducing organisms to then produce gametophytes, which are these swimming unicellular um, seaweed um, cells uh, that then end up producing the next growth of seaweed. So we're, we don't have seeds or anything. It really starts with this swimming unicellular stage. And we wanna be able to get that to work because then the next step will be then into the lab, in the lab, put these spools of fine string into a tank with all these gametophytes, let the gametophytes attach to the spring string, and then over a period of weeks, um, grow these seaweeds up until they become clearly visible like this. And then once that is done, the next step in seaweed cultivation is the deployment in the field. And the way this is done is then we have the, the coil with the string, which we then wrap around a large rope that is very hardy and can be put out in the field. So you can see the string here with the small seaweed specimen. Then we put that in the field and then watch it grow and hopefully it will produce large biomass, which can then be used for a wide range of um, commercial and scientific purposes. And the way we wanna do this, this is still something we're working out is having to have these setups where we have anchors and cinder blocks or other structures that are holding up, holding down these buoys, um, and then having these suspended ropes where we have different species shown in different colors suspended from these buoys. And then we return to these locations, watch when they grow, what time of year is best, and harvest them to perform a range of analysis. This is what it would look from above. So it'll be four different locations where we have these four rows of seaweeds um, ropes growing. Um, how am I doing on time here? Oh, I'm still pretty good. So um, another component is economic assessment. So um, 
the part of the economic assessment, we want to look at the viability and demand potential. Uh, so what are the potential target markets here in Texas um, for seaweed that we produce? What are potential major commercial opportunities and challenges? So what would be great there's areas to focus on, but what are also the risks associated with starting a business in seaweed farming? Also, how can we develop the most cost-effective paths towards growing them in the lab and then transferring them to the field? And that's where our economists will help us and then produce um, a catalog um, of recommendations for optimizing the commercial gains and mitigating the risks of starting a business involving seaweed. So with all of this, um, then we are hoping to build collaborations. And it's one of those cases where um, See, with seaweed farming, there's the potential to create a solution that is good for the environment, but also good for the economy. Um, and oftentimes those two things are um, kind of put at odds with each other, but this shows clearly that that's not how it needs to be. So to work with shellfish farmers around here, and we've already connected with several who are interested in the future and testing so-called polyculture um, setups where we can grow seaweed with clams and oyster, or oysters primarily around here, this has certain benefits um, to both. So the oysters are constantly filtering the water and producing waste. And that waste releases nitrogen and phosphorus, which can be potentially problematic because it can support the growth of harmful algae and phytoplankton. But if you combine it with seaweed, the seaweed will very effectively take up those nutrients and then can be harvested. The other thing is that the seaweed potentially also produces food uh, to the oysters. So if this has been shown to be a successful symbiosis in other places in the world. So we can we want to see if we can do this here as well. We're also in touch with uh, different restaurants and around here who are interested in testing our local seaweed products. And um, perhaps we will contact certain producers of ice cream and other uh, food products. And we're also in touch with the uh, AgriLife facility of uh, Texas A&M, where they grow beef cattle and are interested in feeding trials uh, with seaweed. We're also in touch with organic farmers in Flower Bluffs about potentially uh, doing some tests there. Of course, that's always a, a risky thing for someone growing beef for, uh, for, for uh, reasons of to, to, to produce their bread and butter uh, to feed them seaweed. So perhaps we start with the trials in the controlled university environment first, but there is certainly an interest in incorporating uh, seaweed potentially into the diet and working also with crop farmers. Then other areas that are, we have not explored yet are potentially working with plastic producers or um, companies that produce medical products um, when we produce the seaweed. So these are the great um, economic opportunities. We'll see what happens. And by not only achieving economic success, but also um, achieving a sustainable option um, or sustainable economic um, activity here in Texas waters, we hope that we can add a small portion uh, in the long run to this very major challenge of uh, mitigating global warming in the long run. So seaweed farming is by no means the solution, but it can help. It can be part of the big puzzle uh, that will be required in order to overcome this major challenge. And also in doing so by planting all these, by having seaweed farms, we're hoping that we can contribute to healthier ecosystems uh, where we both have endangered species that can thrive there, but also produce, uh, increase the fisheries and maintain the aesthetic value that we all so much appreciate about this place. So um, I went a little faster than I expected, but that means I have a lot of time for questions. So I'll be very happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Uh, so the question was, what is the timeline on this? Uh, with corn and other agricultural plants, we know already very well when they grow and how long the growth period is. Do we know this about the seaweeds? Well, many of these seaweed species are well characterized and have been, the, our key targets have been cultivated previously. So we know uh, how fast they grow and what the timelines are. And we're talking about, um, well, it varies very much with species, uh, but 
can be weeks to months, um, maybe half a year at the most, for the ones we're growing. I'm not an expert on all seaweed species. Uh, the commercial availability is something, well, we have, this This project is funded until the end of August of 2025. And our main goal is, this is a kind of a proof of concept or pilot study to see, can we establish economically feasible setups to mass produce seaweeds, basically these gametophytes, these unicellular form in the lab so we can put them on the strings and then grow them in, in the field. Uh, we are not, our aim right now is not to um, to prove that it's economically viable. But if if our project is successful, um, then I think by next year, let's say it's very successful, um, we will be able to probably give away or some of our seaweed will be used um, potentially by local restaurants. Uh, we are in touch with local restaurant owners who have exp expressed their interest in that. Um, and we would perhaps start working with businesses um, and giving them the seaweed. So because, because if it's successful, there's no way we have enough freezer space for all the seaweed that uh, we'll be producing. So ideally we'll be giving it away. But the question is, do we have enough takers? That's that's still to be to be determined. Yeah, like is it gonna be three weeks or you know three years down the road before you start getting a commercial farm or is it gonna be 10 years down the road before they start? I think commercial down. farms could be two years down the road. At the pace at which oyster farming is picked up here in Texas in the past years, um, it's, a, booming. Um, uh, I think this could be very fast. We can come up with a good setup. And our goal here is not, because I, I, I study sediments primarily, and uh, I'm, I just am very fascinated by this research. And I want to do the pilot study. And then if we can show that, it's we'll head it off to companies that can then go and, take and run with that. Um, so I think it could be in the next few years, in the next two or three years at the earliest. just mentioned the oyster farming and that looked like a factor in this ecosystem that you're going to be setting up and um, currently there is this moving target for a location for a desal plant which puts a lot of salt back in and threatens the oyster farming and the oyster beds uh, are you taking that into account because right now no one is clear where that is going to wind up, but they have suggested several times to put it north of here, to put it over here. Um, it's very difficult to take that into account because it would change uh, at least, well, I don't know how much it would change the NER, um, but uh, it's, it would just change things so much. So right now we have to just assume that things are will stay the way they are. But if that happened, um, <laughs> quite frankly, that would be, uh, um, that would we would have to think about a lot of things uh, and how to change them. Uh, what I'm not certain of, what I mean, would depend on how much does the salt constant grow, grow up. Um, there are we are we live near um, some bodies of water that are hypersaline that have twice the salinity of seawater where we have seaweed growing in so the Laguna Madre and Baffin Bay. I'm not saying that that we want to turn everything into that. Um, but um, some of the seaweeds can grow there under those conditions. So it wouldn't necessarily be the end of the project, um, but uh, it would change the way we approach our cultivation um, experiments. Uh, do adverse weather conditions such as hurricanes affect? Hurricanes or other adverse weather conditions are a major concern. And Daniel, our research assistant, he's, <clears throat> is an expert in designing field setups for and field experiments. Uh, he's worked with fish in the past, but he's already, he's looking at that right now because one of our field sites uh, or two of our field sites in Copano Bay are exposed to a lot of very strong winds um, and they could be sensible, sensitive. Like uh, even without a hurricane, we could run into problems with our uh, anchors not holding. So he's looking into different possibilities. There's, I'm not very familiar with it, but they're apparently screw anchors that can go into the sediment and provide very strong uh, traction. But when you have a hurricane like Harvey, then um, unfortunately, then you cannot plan for anything like that. I, I was just wondering, it looks like the seaweed is good as long as it's in the water, but once you take it out, it's no longer beneficial. 
it has to be living in water to give the benefits to reduce climate change or um, once you harvest it all and you're putting it into um, at, you know restaurants and other uses um, I, I mean, I guess if you grow it fast enough, you'll always have the seaweed in the water, but doesn't it lose its benefits once it's been harvested? Um, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, so there are so many different benefits here also related to, so yes, when it's in the water and it dies off and sinks to the seafloor and stays there for thousands of years, it's beneficial in terms of removing CO2 from the atmosphere. But if we feed seaweed that's produced in this way without any input of commercial fertilizer um, or use of gas guzzling um, equipment or long transport chains, um, it becomes, it has a very low carbon footprint compared to many commercial crops. So if we're looking at one-to-one -one com comparing wheat to certain seaweed species, we may still be better um, in terms of the carbon footprint. The other thing is if we feed the cattle, it doesn't end up going to sediments, but we're producing potentially much less methane um, that's going to the atmosphere. So it's, it's one of the interesting things that, that it connects to so many different things related to the carbon cycle. Um, and th that's true for different uses um, of it. Yeah. Right. Um, used for food or for, or, or, or yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I can't say I've thought about it, but maybe, maybe it's not ideal for food once it's been on the beach, um, but maybe you could make bioplastics or many of the properties could still be relevant. Um, and on that note, there, there was actually a pilot project part of offshore Texas to look at growing sargassum out there, but I'm not sure what happened to that project, but we're getting a research vessel here in the coming years. At least that's what everything's looking like. It's being funded by this uh, the part of the funding we received from the Texas State Senate. That will enable us to also do potentially look at offshore locations to do some, grow some of the more offshore uh, species of seaweed, such as sargassum. But with respect to your question about stuff that gets washed up here, I think it certainly would be an important thing to look at. Uh, how can we actually use that rather than just burying it in the dunes? But the, the amounts might be so, it might be so unpredictable and the amounts so large that it's hard to do that, but you never know. I appreciate your work. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned you were in contact with like local restaurants. Yep. Uh, how would someone get in contact for that? Because my parents own a restaurant here and they would probably be very interested, interested in this. What was your question? That sounds great. Yeah. So I don't know how what what the in terms of legal obstacles. How do you how do restaurants get to sell oysters from here? Do you need to go through some? Probably you have to. There have to be some nutritional analysis. Um, so that's something we're going to do. We're going to send off our samples for nutritional analysis to make sure they're not rich in mercury or cadmium or other heavy metals. Um, so we're going to have those kinds of analysis to hopefully show that they're safe to eat. Uh, but other than that, we are happy to um, if we have enough to provide them to local restaurants for use. So uh, please, uh, my, my email address is here and you can contact me anytime. Okay. Other questions? One of your slides had the figure 0-0-1. Now to me, that means nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Mm -hmm. Was that correct? That those figures seem awfully low to be utilized in fertilizer. The first number is always nitrogen. And that's zero, it was zero in the picture. It was, it was more towards the beginning of your present. There uh, it is. Kelp green, zero, good zero, question. one. Yeah, what that zero, zero, one stands, I don't know, actually. Uh, we'll do it. It'd be good to, to look it up. 
I just threw this on there as an example of a commercial product, uh, but I did not do research on this one. Okay. Are you familiar with um, regenerative agriculture? Um, like a little Ray, bit. It's something I'm very interested in. Yeah. Ray Archuleta's work in the recent movie Common Ground. Um, because no. it seems to me that what you're doing with in the sea is exactly the same thing as farmers are doing yeah. with no till and cover crops. It's it's, it's basically the same basically same general the, idea. Yeah. Yes. Except the ocean is much bigger, and right. one of the so soils are also great carbon sinks, but the carbon doesn't stay there as long because we have oxygen there. Uh, most of the soils, agricultural fields are oxygenated and where there's oxygen, there's more efficient decomposition of organic carbon to CO2 and not so much methane. Um, people use biochar, uh, something they supplement the agricultural oh, soils yes. with that's not very degradable. Uh, that could be very powerful. The marine sediments we have Below the top few millimeters, we have anoxic, so oxygen-free sediments where decomposition is slowed tremendously. And this is part of the reason why marine sediments are such good carbon sinks of a long time, because under anoxic or oxygen-free conditions, the microbes, the ability of microbes to degrade the organic carbon, the seaweed biomass, is lower. Right. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Yes, you you need to get leases, um, and we're actually we're trying to get. We haven't gotten our approved approval for our um, test sites yet, so we have to go through National Marine Fisheries because um, they're concerned with entanglements of of manatees or sea turtles or other larger organisms. Um, there's concerns about being too close to the shipping lanes, so the Army Corps of Engineer is involved. It has to be safe for boat traffic, um, so. Many of the leases with respect to that then are ultimately administered by the Texas General Land Office, uh, but it has to go through several other agencies first. They have to approve it. We have a question back here. Just, just a quick one. Are you in contact with or getting advice from any of those Asian countries where it's grown so prolifically? No, but that's a great idea. I don't have any contacts. Thanks. <laughs> I work with people there, but not they're not seaweed farmers, so yeah. Right. I thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's the nutritional value of seaweed? I, I know that it had vitamin C up there, but what else? Uh, what other yeah. certain, vitamins? Minerals? Certain um, are rich in um, fatty acids, so uh, um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. They are rich in iodine, um, nitrogen, phosphorus. They, they vary very much in composition. So some are rich in lipids, so fats. That, those are the ones that are being exper experimented with for producing biodiesel. Um, others are rich in saccharides, polysaccharides. So they're rich in sugars. Um, and there's others that are more protein rich. So it's, it's a wide spectrum. Because uh, seaweed, as we call, I'm just talking about seaweed as if it were one, but we're talking about organisms that are very, very distantly related and have very different chemical makeups. Any other questions? Are you limiting your experiments to plants that uh, would uh, be only locally found here to avoid in, in invasive species from being introduced? Yeah. And is there a danger of uh, that introduction of invasive species. Yeah, so the reason why we're only focusing on species that are growing right here and in the National Estuary Research Reserve here is because, and ones that have been here for a long time, as, as far as we can look back, is we want to, at any cost, avoid introducing new species and causing uh, problems by, by doing that. So we're exclusively focusing on our native uh, seaweed species. I want to ask a question about um, the transfer from the lab to out in the out in the field. Once you have that there, 
will you leave enough so that they will regenerate or are you going to constantly have to grow it in the lab to replant? It's a great question, really great question. And I don't know the answer. So I think it may depend on the species. Uh, for some species, if they maintain dense growth and we don't have other organisms coming like weeds, invading the rope and overgrowing them, we might be able to just cut them back and they will grow back kind of kind of like a lawn. Um, with other species, um, that may not be possible, um, either because of their lifestyle um, or that they only are there for a few months of the year and then other stuff comes and lives there or because they get outcompeted by other uh, species. Those would be, have to, we would have to keep redeploying on a regular basis to grow them. We're corn soybean farmers from Nebraska. And I just think about the inputs on this are, I mean, off the return is amazing. If you can pull this off, it's really incredible. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. We have time for one more question. So could you also do a similar thing in a pond? Yep. With, with common seaweed that we have in lakes and ponds and stuff? It's a great that question, totally yeah. We can do that with freshwater algae. Actually, one of the species we're looking at is a problem in the Great Lakes uh, because it, it's, it's called ulva intestinalis and in areas where there's a lot of nitrogen input there, you have, it's, it's a big problem because it, it thrives so much. So people should harvest it there. But there's many different uh, freshwater, algae, and plants that can also be used. And this is something we're not considering here, but I spent quite some time in Japan doing research there, and it was on the menus of some, some of my favorite seaweed there, or not seaweed, algae was freshwater, or freshwater plants and algae that are being used there. So certainly this could also be done. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Next uh, lecture is Sharon Hertza and she will be discussing the Gulf of Mexico holistically. So the whole Gulf, we'll take a look at that next week. So hopefully you can join us, thank you.